This is the production version of the Snapmaker U1, a budget tool changer 3D printer that broke Kickstarter records with over $20 million raised. And in all honesty, I was pretty darn skeptical. Four independent tool heads, fully automatic calibration, at a price that's literally multiples less of its closest competitor, well, surely there's a catch, and maybe there is. Or just maybe, the Snapmaker U1 might just have what it takes to shake up the 3D printing landscape in ways you've never even dreamt of. Let's get started. How's it going guys, Angus here from Makers Muse and welcome back to a good old fashioned review. I've not done one like this for some time. And that's partly because I'm a bit more picky these days, but also partly because I don't sign any documents or let companies have any level of influence on what I say. And these days, that discourages quite a few of them. But when it came to the Snapmaker U1, they were totally cool with that. They said, hey, we wanna send you a production version free of charge. I sent them my review terms and here it is, nice and simple. You can find purchase links in the video description below, but for now, let's dig in. The U1 is the latest printer from Snapmaker, who have been in the 3D printing space for quite some time now. You might know them from their first machine, the Snapmaker 1, with its odd modular and cantilever design with over-engineered linear stages for all axes. The focus of that machine and its success of the Snapmaker 2 was one of multi-purpose tool heads, so you could 3D print, laser cut, and CNC on the same machine, a three-way compromise that I've always thought was kinda dumb. So ignorant me ignored the hype that was quietly growing on Kickstarter over the new U1 until I had people reach out to me and strongly recommend that I took a look. And you guys were right. This is nothing like the previous machines from Snapmaker. It's a completely new beast. The U1 has a print volume of 270 by 270 by 270 millimeters, which is a really decent size and a noticeable step up from the norm without the overall printed dimensions getting too outrageous. But at around 18 kilograms, it's certainly one hefty beast. And that's because it has four extruders in a tool changer arrangement. This is a similar concept to the tool changer on a CNC machine where different size cutting bits can be selected to do different things in the same job. But in this case, it's four 3D printing extruder and hot end assemblies. And these heads all need to be able to be collected, printed with, and then docked reliably hundreds of times within a single print. It's a marvel of engineering, and one I'll be stress testing a lot during the course of this review. When you open the box, you'll be immediately greeted with a quick start guide. Yes, it is quite thick for a quick start guide, and it's all very important, so read it. This is because the U1 is pretty complex compared to other printers in this price bracket, and if the U1 is your first ever 3D printer, then you're in for a bit of a learning curve. Now, Snapmaker has done a great job walking you through every single step, but there really, really is a lot of them, and I admit I got confused by a fair few of them, so I recommend reading the booklet first, familiarizing yourself with how it all goes together, and only then proceeding with the unboxing and setup process. I want to applaud Snapmaker on how securely packaged this printer arrived. They've clearly learned quite a lot in the pre-production phase, but the sheer amount of tape and even huge single-use plastic pieces that you discard after unpacking, it's a little bit much, especially because removing some of the tape seems to pull a fair few of the flimsy plastic covers free, so you might want to leave those bits in place. Being the production version of this unit, I was very curious to inspect the quality of the tool heads, and man, have we come a very long way in just a few years. These extruder units all have complex integrated extruder and hot-end assembly. This unfortunately means that the days of simply changing nozzles when you have a clog are long gone. The heat sink, heat break, heat block, and nozzle are all one unit, and you need to replace everything in one go. It's a direction the industry has been moving in for quite some time now, and I'm okay-ish with it so long as they continue to support the printer for a long time, and the spare nozzle assemblies aren't too outrageously expensive. You'll also need to attach the spool holders and these little motorized feeder units which help pull filament up off the roll and push it into the wetting extruder. And these are a small touch, but they're very handy indeed. I think it's really funny that the original UP 3D printer from Tier Time had a similar motorized feeder from the spool way back in 2010, but that was dropped and no one picked it up until Bamboo Labs AMS Systems made it so customers started to expect some kind of auto feed system. 
It's only a few bucks worth of motors and electronics, but it does make a world of difference to the filament loading speed and the overall end user experience. I will say that the angle of filament comes in from the PTFE tubes is sometimes a little bit off and it means it gets stuck and doesn't feed all the way into the extruder. So make sure you snip the filament tip at an angle or just watch it when it's loading and give the tube a little bit of a wiggle. If it's getting stuck, you'll be fine. And speaking of bamboo, are you getting that funny, almost uncanny feeling looking at this printer? You could say that Snapmaker's industrial designers have been, um, inspired by the Bamboo Lab lineup. From the spool holders to the color scheme, I get it, customers buy what they know or what they think they know, but I'm not much of a fan of this medical white, gray and beige aesthetic. Thankfully though, beneath the injection molded exterior is a super solid sheet metal chassis, which is more than rigid enough to handle the high speed printing this machine is capable of once you calibrate it. The reason this machine is so much more complex to set up than normal is because, well, there's four times as many extruders, cables, and filament holders as usual, and they all need to be hooked up correctly or you'll be in a world of hurt. Each tool head has this sliding metal bracket on the front, and they are parked into the magazine through use of locating pins and strong magnets. The carriage moves in front of the selected tool and through an honestly ingenious combination of movements, locks it into the sliding metal bracket, and locates onto these three hemispherical indexing points, securing it in place with no additional motors or actuators needed. It's a very accurate system, but there will still be subtle differences to the nozzle location between the tools, and these differences need to be calibrated for. In the dark ages of 3D printing, you had to do this sort of thing manually, and it was a royal pain in the bum. But the U1 does it all for you, automatically. Fingers crossed it goes well for you because it's during this stage that any structural issues with your machine will rear their ugly head. And I did have some issues with tools failing to park correctly during the initial setup and calibration procedure, which was a worrying sign, but with a firmware update, everything seems to be resolved and I haven't encountered any further problems with docking. So now, with that out of the way, we can move on to print quality. Long story short, stunning. This machine came with this multicolored dragon demo print and honestly, weird choice. The texture makes it look like the printer had crazy extrusion <laughs> problems, but I promise you it's actually meant to look like that. Next up was this multicolor cube I threw together to get an idea of how well the full, the four tool heads were aligned. And again, it seemed to print perfectly with no issues at all. The print quality is crisp and there is no color bleeding because there is no purging between colors. And that's the beauty of tool changes. Each extruder is a fully isolated system with its own color or material, and it cuts down waste dramatically. Moving on, we have the Autodesk calibration print, and I'd call this an almost perfect score. The pins all fell away straight away when I removed it from the bed. Overhangs are clean, as are the bridges, and the spires have some minor stringing, but no blobbing. And of course, naturally, I've broken some of them already. But yeah, this is one of the better calibration prints I've seen in recent years. So even though the tool heads are compact, the cooling still seems to be quite good. Alrighty, no more messing around. I threw my clearance castle at the U1 next, but to spice things up even further, I assigned a second extruder to the tower and drawbridge and the port colors, which means there'll be a tool change every second layer because you can get away with two before having to dock and retrieve the next one. So roughly 300 tool changes. And <laughs> you wouldn't even know. This is a fantastic result for a single color 3D printer. And you don't even consider the fact that it's printed with two extruders in multicolor. All the parts move as they should. And even the top of the drawbridge with those near impossible overhangs printed really well, like better than most printers that just have a single extruder. What's going on? I'm really trying not to gush, but I cannot stress enough how good the printing is regardless of the multi-head system. And with that system, I do have to also stress how little waste there is compared to an AMS. Yes, there still are prime towers. This is the prime tower for the castle and these are the prime towers for all the other demo prints I've done. So there is still waste, but there's not nearly as much purge waste. In fact, these are all the purges from the, the tools priming in the little somewhat flimsy purge bucket that I've had to do for all of this testing. You would have had way more waste than this on a comparable AMS like the AMS Lite connected to the A1 Mini. And that's why I don't print multicolor on those machines in general. It just takes too long and it creates such a mess to be worthwhile to me. It's just not worth it. But 
This is totally different. It makes it easier, dare I say, almost as easy as just running single color prints. But the reason I think the U1 is really gonna shake up the 3D printing space isn't because of good multicolor models. I actually don't really care about multicolor models. What I actually do care about is the fact it can combine up to four different rigid and flexible filaments into one print without choking. Check this out. This is a foamed TPU combined directly with a 72D TPU hub. That's an incredibly soft material bonded seamlessly to what is effectively a semi-flex as the hub. I released a video recently testing the viability of foam filaments as wheels and tires, but with a single extruder printer, you still need to secure it to the motor shaft with a hub you print separately and somehow secure the two together. And flexible filaments do not work in the Bamboo Lab automatic material systems. And honestly, I wasn't sure if it would succeed on a tool changer either, so I was shocked at how well it works but it is not without its flaws. See how one of these tires looks quite good, but the other is full of unsightly bumps? Well, this is to do with the tool changer routine. It pauses at the end of each run before parking, and with regular filaments, this isn't so much of an issue, but with flexible filaments, especially foaming ones, this one second pause is enough for some filament to burp out of the hot end and creates these unsightly zits around the edge of the print. I'm hoping that in the next firmware update, this pause could be removed or at least somehow controlled or modified so the hot end moves off the print or even into the perimeter of the print before parking because I think that's all it would take to stop this issue. Unfortunately, with stringing filaments, the act of docking and undocking print heads, even with the prime tower, is enough to add some unslightly stringing to your prints. I cut up this cylinder with a screw thread to test an idea I've had for ages, combining a flex contact surface with a rigid hub. And in this case, it's PETG mixed with PEBA. PEBA is so new that there's no real info on what it bonds to. So I decided to give beam interlocking a go, which physically locks dissimilar materials together using these lattice style structures. They're a bit messy, especially with a shape like this, but they seem to do the trick. Like with foamed TPU, pauses between the tool changing really does seem to have an effect on the print quality in some areas of the PIBA, but it's still really cool that this kind of thing is now possible. Though I will note that the Bamboo Lab H2D can do flexibles and rigid combinations with this dual extruder setup. I just don't have one of those units to compare, and it is honestly a very different beast at a higher price point, though it is fully enclosed, and the Snapmaker U1 isn't. So if you want to print filaments that need an enclosed chamber, talking ABS, uh, polycarbonate blends, anything that warps, well, can't really do it here unless they brought out some kind of aftermarket enclosure or someone made some abomination of one to try to make it work. It's not really designed for it. If you wanna do anything like that, or even carbon fiber nylon, these nozzles are not hardened. It's not designed for it. You're gonna to have to go with something like the Bamboo Lab H2D instead. Alrighty, so the U1 prints great and has brave new possibilities at a yet unseen price point. What's the catch? There has to be a catch, right? Well, there are a few things you should be aware of. Number one, it's loud. Oh boy, is it loud. You've got high speed fans going at all times, but things get incredibly loud when the machine's zipping around at max speed. And that little part cooling fan in the carriage really pumps out a lot of air and well, noise. So don't expect to work next to this thing while it's going full tilt because it might drive you insane. Secondly, Snapmaker includes RFID tags in their spools, which syncs up in their own branch of Orca Slicer. Yes, it can be handy to know what filament type and color you've loaded automatically, but to me, it's always a bit of a red flag because it means that they could update future firmware, which locks out spools from other companies. I don't think they'll do this because of the direction they've gone, but I've given Bamboo Lab a hard time for this in the past, so I gotta keep things fair. But unlike Bamboo Lab, I haven't had to sign up to any account or log into anything beyond hooking this thing up to my local Wi-Fi over LAN so I can connect to it to my PC. This machine does not need cloud access. You don't have to use the app. You absolutely can if you like, it's a pretty good app, but you don't have to use it if you don't care about controlling your printer remotely from your smartphone. They're not trying to control what you can and can't slice with either. In fact, you can go right ahead and ignore their Orca Slicer reskin and just use stock Orca Slicer because they have a profile already ready to go in that. Although I think it's funny that the profile in Orca Slicer has more settings like defaults ready to go, whereas their version only has 0.2 settings. So you actually might wanna try Orca Slicer for the varied settings anyway. And I really like the fact that they're not locking you down. And if you do use Orca Slicer, you're greeted with their default main cell interface, 
where you can access the Clipper config files, monitor print jobs, and do all that sort of thing direct from Orca Slicer. You can really dive in and get your hands dirty if you so choose. So with all of that said, should you get the U1? Well, it's a pretty compelling machine, but as impressive as it is for the price point, it's still not for everyone. By design, a four head tool changing system will be more complex and more prone to failure than a single extruder 3D printer. So if all you care about is printing in one material, then the Bamboo Lab A1 or A1 Mini are still, in my opinion, the best budget printers on the market for that if you just want to print and it's simple. But if you want to print multicolor models or if you want to print multi-material models and you don't want to have to worry about huge amounts of little purge poops filling up your workshop, then the U1 starts to make a heck of a lot more sense. And it's the only printer on the market below $2,000 that can print multiple kinds of flexible filaments in one print. There are not many tool changer 3D printers on the market today, but if you want one that's bigger than this machine or has an extra extruder, then you have the option of the Prusa XL, which is a beast of a printer. It's a really solid choice. It's larger. It has an enclosure where you can print high temperature materials, which you can add on as an optional extra, but it's also over three times the price. I hate that Snapmaker used Kickstarter as a promotional tool to launch this printer. Snapmaker are clearly gunning for fans of Bamboo Lab printers with the styling and overall feel of the machine, but I'm glad to see that it's not just a surface polish on an underwhelming experience. It really did deliver, at least for me, when it works. Mine did, but many other reviewers had less than stellar reliability from their units, both pre and post-production units. So make sure you watch a range of unbiased actual reviews before pulling the trigger. And if you're one of those $20 million worth of backers who are anxiously waiting your U1, you're in for a treat. As the U1 says on the splash screen, go make something wonderful. Just please read that booklet. Thanks for watching guys, bye.